So Bob uh, is technical staff at, in the optical and quantum communication technology group at MIT Lincoln Lab in Lexington. Uh, his work focuses on designing, building, testing, and deploying free space optical communication systems. He joined the lab in 2005 and has worked in many roles on many programs, including the Lunar Laser Communications Demonstration. He is currently the test and operations lead for the lab's NASA efforts. He does hold a bachelor's in uh, optical engineering from Rose Holman Institute of Technology and a master's in electrical engineering from the University of Connecticut. So welcome, Bob. It's great to have you, and I will turn it over to you. Sounds great. Thanks so much for that uh, great introduction. Um, is my screen sharing okay? Yep. Awesome. Thanks. All right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the topic of today is optical communications for human space exploration. This is um, going to go over uh, Lincoln Laboratory efforts in collaboration with NASA on developing optical communications technologies for the, for the future of human space exploration. Um, we've been working with NASA over over a number of years on different technologies, and this uh, will give a uh, um, start off with like a motivation and background kind of going over uh, how this technology started, how it's evolved over the last uh, 20 or so years, and then covering a couple of current projects that we're working on and go over what this looks like in the future. So right now, uh, NASA is really invested in human space exploration at the low Earth level. Uh, as you can see here is the International Space Station on the left. And really since the Apollo era back in the late 60s to early 70s, we've been stuck here. We've been in low Earth orbit. A lot of great science has been happening, um, but that's kind of where it stayed. And there's a lot of interest in, in continuing this work and uh, needing for, for greater data rates than we, we currently have for new uh, technologies like such which is 8K video or, or other scientific data. Um, but in addition to the, those needs that are, are present now at low Earth orbit, there's a great desire for exploring way beyond out into deep space. So we're, uh, NASA is looking to go back to moon, the moon with the, the Artemis program. You may have uh, heard some of that in the news. Right now, the uh, Artemis 1 mission is um, going through some test, uh, test events um, to prepare that spacecraft to go out to the moon with uh, an uncrewed mission. Um, but then quickly after, there will be a, a crewed mission that we are a part of. And NASA doesn't have their sights just set on the moon, but further on, you know, there's a lot of interest in Mars and, and further, further out there. And there's a great need for uh, data to get back, um, both say, to send data to the humans that are going to be exploring and to get data back from there. So uh, current RF technologies have a lot of restrictions in the data rate that you can get back. And there's a, a great need for, for a technology that can offer higher data rates. And laser communications or optical communications or laser com kind of use those three terminologies uh, interchangeably um, is a solution that, that can really help. And uh, one of the reasons for that, um, what we're looking at here on the right-hand side, uh, comparing a beam size from the moon, uh, on the top there in yellow is an RF beam with a, a 75 centimeter aperture antenna. Um, you get a, a beam size that's over 6,400 6, kilometers in diameter. That's, that's over the size of North America. That's pretty darn big. And you can think about it, all the power that you're sending out is distributed over that wide area, meaning that you're losing a lot of your power uh, and not collecting it efficiently with your receiver on the earth, which would be a, a large antenna dish. And this is the motivation for having these really large size antenna dishes that can be tens of meters in diameter because you're trying to capture as much of that energy as possible to, to get your communication signal. Um, because of diffraction and, and R squared losses, optical signals, which have a much lower wavelength, uh, diverge much, much less than the RF signals. So uh, equivalently from the moon, you can have a 10 centimeter aperture, so a much smaller sized antenna, optically speaking, than, than the RF system. And that produces only a six kilometer diameter beam. So your power now is distributed just over that much smaller area. Therefore, you need a lot less power or a smaller antenna uh, to get high data rates. So you get much greater power efficiency by moving into the optical regime. Um, and I'll motivate this in the, in the next couple of slides, like why we have a need for high data rate. But 
uh, we, we need that data rate uh, for various reasons. And the RF technologies just are, are too power inefficient to uh, really provide that. Um, another issue in my third bullet here is that um, the RF spectrum is regulated and that creates a lot of administrative hurdles. Um, you have to uh, basically fight for, for what spectrum you're looking to use. And with optical technologies, you're not concerned with that. So it creates a lot less paperwork and a lot less headaches and gives you the ability to do a lot more science. Um, so with optical technologies, it really enables us to do lower cost and higher value missions in the future. So one of the, one of the current drives um, and low Earth orbit and soon to be in, in deep space and beyond is what humans need. And pictured here are just three different examples of uh, a various thing activities that have happened on the International Space Station. Uh, so for example, um, for space medicine purposes, we need in the low megabits per second of uplink and downlink uh, data rates. Uh, right now, the, the International Space Station through its RF means has about a 600 megabit per second downlink and 25 megabit per second uplink, um, which is good. It can handle um, some of these events, but you can think about it. There's not just one person on the International Space Station. There are many and there's a lot of competing interests over, over what to do. So if you're doing something like this, you could think of one of these activities as taking up the entire bandwidth of the, of the space station. So you really need to um, prioritize and fight over the time um, over how this bandwidth is used. So it creates a lot of uh, extra difficulties. Um, some other, uh, other uh, items like this are software updates. If, if software needs update, updated, you need at least a 20 megabit per second up, uplink. And then um, you're up in space a long time, you're gonna wanna watch the movies. Uh, so there's a need there for just kind of leisure activities for the astronauts. And um, we joke a lot that we're basically enabling Netflix to the moon in, in some of our technologies. But um, while there's a joke factor to that, there, there is some reality that um, as we're exploring space, we, we wanna have, um, more, more abilities for quality of life for the astronauts. Um, we can think of not just watching movies and streaming movies, but doing something like this, having a Zoom feed where you're, you're having a, uh, a, a two-way conversation um, and ends up being able to support multiple Zoom feeds at the same time. So there's a need for, for greater data. Uh, and, and with this, uh, LaserCom gives you the ability to meet a lot of these data rate needs and gives you uh, real-time access to do a lot of these things. So that's uh, kind of the low Earth orbit and, and where humans are right now. And we want to be able to get this type of capability out to deep space and beyond. So, uh, for example, um, here now, we're, we're not, we are not sending crewed missions out to Mars yet, but we do have $6 billion worth of assets at Mars um, between a couple different rovers and a couple different uh, observatories and, and, and various satellites that are out there collecting science data. Uh, one of the challenges even now for these, these missions is that you do have a, a small uh, data pipe to get stuff back down to Earth. So a lot of the scientists who have these really amazing instruments on these, uh, on these science experiments out there have to fight over how that data comes down. So even though you've set these really amazing things out there and spent a lot of money to do that, we're really limited by how fast data can get down there. So one estimate right now has it that there's like 250 terabytes worth of data out there. And using the, the conventional RF uh, dishes that are out there now, the estimate is that it would take over 10 years to get that data down. Um, but with, uh, with a typical optical downlink that's been uh, been proposed, uh, you could get that same data down in a, in a few months to a year, depending on uh, how much power and, and aperture size you'd like to have on that, that link. So in, in cases like this, um, just for science exploration, there's a really big advantage for laser comm enabled links. Um, and you could think again, as now that we're sending humans out here, there's gonna be an even bigger need for having a high data rate path back to the earth. Uh, so with that, I um, just kind of want to talk through some of the, the various space laser connectivities that have that have happened to date. Um, we're showing about a 20 year span here since the early 2000s. Um, up on top here, I know this is, this is a pretty busy chart. I'll, I'll try to talk through it here. Up on kind of the top couple of rows are uh, various activities that uh, Lincoln Lab and, and NASA and other American agencies have been involved with. And just to show that there's there's wider interest in this than the in the global community, um, there's also a lot of programs that have been 
been taking place from the, the European Space Agency or the ESA and uh, the Jap Jap Japanese Space Agency as well has had a lot of uh, interesting programs. So just calling out a few of these programs, um, a lot of this work was paved the way by uh, Geolight which was a Lincoln Laboratory program um, back in the early 2000s. And that was a, a geosynchronous link that would uh, send a, a satellite up to geosynchronous orbit and had a laser comm link back down to the Earth. And then soon after, there was a, the ALEX program, which had an aircraft to geosynchronous orbit uh, laser comm link to demonstrate that those types of links were possible. Then the next piece of the puzzle then is, can you go from the air down to the ground? And that was shown in the focal program in the, the late uh, decade of the 2000s and um, able to achieve data rates at about two and a half gigabits per second. Um, and there are a lot of um, follow on programs kind of related to that work. And uh, one of the really big programs that, that happened that really, that really paved a way for uh, the programs that I'm going to going to be talking about today and some of the future efforts was the LLCD program or the Lunar Laser Communication Program. This was a collaboration between NASA and, and Lincoln Laboratory that had a Earth to Moon link and were able to demonstrate up to 622 megabits per second from the moon. Um, and this was just a, a, a much, uh, a really revolution in, in the data rate capabilities. Uh, the Apollo era a spacecraft that went to the moon, for example, had about a one megabit per second link. So, you know, your orders of magnitude greater than that. Um, and with this technology, part of the goal of, of Lincoln Laboratory, um, we're, a, we're a federally funded research and development center. And, and one of our goals is to develop technology of, of interest to the nation and then transfer that technology back to government organizations. So one of the goals here is for NASA and, and other government organizations to be able to uh, take technologies that we believe are important and help them transition it and actually be deploying this. So there is the OPAL program uh, developed by NASA and JPL that deployed to the International Space Station. So this was a, a LASIKOM effort that uh, was completely NASA and, and JPL run, um, kind of fulfilling that mission of uh, not just keeping this to Lincoln, but, but proliferating it out throughout uh, government agencies and industry. And that kind of brings us up to the modern day. Um, LLCD was a really big success and it gave NASA uh, confidence that, that laser comm technology was, was important for, for future missions and viable, that it could be a really useful and, and important tool for, for this human space exploration that they would like to embark on in the coming decades. Um, and so there's, there's all these programs here that I'm gonna touch on throughout the, uh, throughout the talk here. Um, so I'll get into more details on these later, but um, first up uh, is LCRD, which is another geosynchronous link. Um, and this was more run by NASA than Lincoln Laboratory. So again, um, putting this uh, technology out into industry. Um, and that is gonna talk to the Illumina-T program, which is a joint NASA and Lincoln effort. So Illuma T is on the International Space Station designed to talk to LCRD in geosynchronous orbit. And then this paves the way for the Orion EM2 mission, or we're calling it O2O. This is um, the next crewed mission to the moon set to launch in 2024 that I'll be getting into more details on. Um, but this is again a, a moon to Earth link, but now with uh, the difference being that it's a human uh, crewed mission. And then we have a couple other science missions that are, are looking to pave the way in different regards um, in the future that I'll talk on later. One of them is T-Bird. Um, this is using a high data rate burst uh, of, of data from low Earth orbit. And then DSOC is a NASA JPL design program to go out past Mars um, towards the Psyche, uh, Psyche asteroid um, near the uh, between Mars and Jupiter and demonstrating optical communications technologies and showing what that can do for really deep space um, data return. So I'd like to dive into LLCD a bit because this was such an important technology uh, and important demonstration. Uh, this launched back in 2013. Um, it was aboard uh, the Lunar Atmosphere and Dust Environment Explorer, or LADI. You're going to see here that we love acronyms and everything has an acronym. So this was the LADI spacecraft. And the purpose of the spacecraft was to go um, investigate a, a phenomenon that was observed back on one of the Apollo missions. Um, so it was, it was measuring the lunar dust. Um, but part of, part of the experiment is that it had, uh, part, of that, part of that mission rather, is that it had room for uh, testing out various scientific payloads of, of potential future interest to NASA. And because there was this interest in 
laser communications technology, we were able to effectively hitch a ride there and deploy a laser comm system um, just to basically try the technology out and see, um, give, uh, give the NASA brass a chance to see if this technology would worth and if it was worth uh, investing in in future missions. So the, uh, the payload, the laser comm payload that was, was launched um, was a pulse position modulation system. Um, it had a 622 megabit per second downlink and a 20 megabit per second uplink. Uh, it had a space telescope, it had the, the optical module, which you can see here, that's the telescope design. Um, it was about a, I think it was a four, uh, four inch aperture. Um, it weighed about 30 kilograms. Um, it had a wall plug power of 90 watts, um, which resulted in a half watt laser transmitter back down to the earth. The primary ground terminal was located in White Sands, New Mexico. You can see here it was a, a Connex trailer with then a, a dome here with four receive apertures, which are these large apertures here, and then four smaller transmit apertures. And uh, one of the, as I showed, one of the, the key advantages of LaserCom is how small the beams are. Uh, in certain circles, that, that's considered a big disadvantage or a risk. Um, one of the concerns over LaserCom technologies is, can you actually acquire a beam that narrow? Can you track on that beam? Uh, can you do that repeatedly? Can you do that reliably? Can you look at uh, between multiple ground terminals? And that was one of the real big uh, questions that, that LLCD had to try to solve. And it was shown that we were able to really reliably point, um, point the ground terminal to the location of the space terminal and then point the space terminal back to the ground terminal and acquire beams in both directions and then very quickly establish a comm link and perform error-free uh, optical communications. One of the other concerns with, with uh, laser comm that that um, RF systems don't have to deal with as much is what's the effect of atmosphere, right? If you have clouds coming in, um, both atmosphere, then also if you are low on the horizon, you get a lot more atmos atmospheric scintillations, you know, going through more and more atmosphere. So we were able to demonstrate that the technology worked very well through um, some partial cloud cover and through very low elevation angles uh, through the atmosphere. So uh, overall, it was just incredible success. Um, Part of that success is that we, we demonstrated uh, simultaneous high definition video streams going um, both up and down, um, broadcasting both live uh, video and pre recorded video, uh, looping back video. Uh, we were able to accommodate delay tolerances. Um, and then the technology also included time of flight measurements. So effectively, you can, through the comm signal, um, you know the signal that you're sending up. And so if you, if you loop that data back down, then you can measure the time that it's sent and measure the time that it's arrived and measure a full time of flights. This can give you raising, ranging uh, information in, in addition to the communications information. Um, and uh, one, one really cool thing that happened is there's actually a uh, one time where there was uh, an issue that happened with the, the onboard software of Laddie and uh, they wanted to diagnose what, what had happened. And they had a, a a RF dish on here as well, in addition to our laser comm dish that they were using for most of the 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 uh, the missions operations. Um, but it was too slow to really really look at what the problem was with the with with the with their software. So we were able to come in and say you can download this very quickly over the laser comm link. So they had a um, really a data dump of their software um, really quickly over the laser comm link. They were then able to diagnose what what the problems were and fix those and and do a, an uplink of the, of the fixed software in order to continue operations. So it's just kind of a demonstration of why these, these high data rates are, are really useful. Um, so after this technology demonstration um, was completed, uh, NASA was very happy with it and was looking for uh, utilizing this in, in, in the future. So the technology was transferred back to NASA to support the laser communications relay demonstration, which is the technology we'll talk about next. So yeah, next up, I'd like to dive into some of the details on LCRD, um, which is a the geosynchronous um, platform, and then Illumina-T, which is the uh, ISS-based platform in low Earth orbit that we'll talk to. So just very quickly here, um, LCRD is up here, um, which is in geosynchronous orbit, and uh, that is designed to talk to Illumina-T, 
uh, which is a, a terminal that is aboard the Illuminate uh, or the, the International Space Station. And then there are several ground stations um, across the United States that this is designed to talk to. Um, I'll dive into each of these, each of these uh, systems in, in subsequent slides. But this overall link is designed to provide up to a 1.2 gigabit per second return for the International Space Station. So currently, the International Space Station has a 600 megabit per second return link, or you could think of that as the downlink, what's coming back down to Earth. Um, and then for the astronauts, what they're really excited about is this provides a 150 megabit per second forward link. So going from the ground to, to the International Space Station. Right now, that's limited to 25 megabits per second. And so you can think of all the information they'd, they'd like to be seeing from the Earth. They're concerned about how much information can come back. So LCRD, um, as many of you guys um, may have heard, this um, successfully launched back in December. So this is um, was launched in December, um, reached geosynchronous orbit soon after, and has been going through some uh, tests with the with the ground terminals until Aluma T is launched and, and is on the ISS. Uh, so, so far, this has been a very successful initial phase rollout. Um, I don't have a whole lot to talk about it. Um, I know NASA folks are This is their future, so um, stay tuned if you're interested in this. I know uh, NASA folks will be um, will be giving a lot more technical details about this uh, very soon. Um, so effectively, the uh, LCRD stands for Laser Communications Relay Demonstration. The purpose is to relay signals between two platforms. So um, as shown here, you can relay between two different ground ground systems or one ground system and a space terminal. Um, it's designed to be a two-year demonstration, so it, it launched uh, in December, and uh, the plan is for that to run for a couple years and hopefully a, a couple uh, years afterwards. Um, part of the goal was also to get an increased industry involvement. Um, with this technology being so important for uh, the future, uh, the hope is that more <laughs> industry partners can be joining to, to be building the, the, the space so that we're less contingent on a, a research laboratory like Lincoln or, or NASA developing their own efforts into this. So um, a lot of effort, and you'll kind of see this as a theme throughout the, the rest of this presentation. Uh, one of the goals is to get more and more industry partners built up so that we can uh, move the, move the, the building and, and, and technology base out into, out into industry. So in this case, the, the ground terminals are, are acting as user terminals, and um, this can provide up to 1.2 gigabit per second link between those terminals and then other platforms that can come on board. One of the hopes that the NASA had as well is that um, more uh, users can come in from kind of a, an experimental perspective, like saying what else they'd like to see done with this technology at these rates. So they're hoping more partners come on there as well. One thing to note as well is that there is an RF back channel link here um, from, the, from the geosynchronous uh, satellite uh, down to the main ground terminal, which is in White Sands, New Mexico. Um, but then the two main ground terminals are in Hawaii and then in California. And part of the goal is that these ground terminals as well will be used for multiple programs. So the, the optical ground terminal in California, for example, is also going to be used on the uh, O2O program that I'll, that I'll talk about in the future. So LCRD is designed to talk to Illuma T. Um, pictured here is the International Space Station. Um, the, uh, the actual um, payload is going to go here on the Japanese expansion module, or the GEM, circled in yellow. So you can kind of see here that these little rectangular type of um, platforms that insert, and you can see that there's one empty slot right there. So uh, what's really cool about this, uh, this, this platform is that it's designed for new scientific experiments. So anytime NASA would like to try something out, a, a payload is built with this bus specification and this, this payload size and then can be inserted in there. Um, so this is the, the way that um, we're gonna be, be putting the payload here to uh, demonstrate the, the optical relay capability of, of LCRD. Um, and, and then again, um, what, what we're really excited about is this increases the, uh, the data rate capabilities of the International Space Station from the limited to 600 megabits per second uh, on the return link and 25 now from the, uh, from the uh, forward link, and that'll increase up to 155 megabits per second. So again, this acronym, we, this one has an embedded acronym. This is Integrated LCRD LEO User Modem and Amplifier Terminal. 
So this is what the uh, space terminal element actually looks like. So there's this uh, assembly here that's going to attach to the, the gem. There's an interface bus right here that connects. Um, there's a, a 1553 bus that is, is how the, uh, the uh, ISS connects to this. And then there's also uh, dual ethernet connections for, for the user data that's actually going to flow over this. So the idea then is that um, at, at the International Space Station, they have the traditional um, RF communications link that, that that's also a relay link that goes up to TDRS and back down to a ground terminal uh, that you can have a an, like an ethernet switch that will switch in this network instead of that network. So you can flow ethernet traffic through this network at the higher data rate. So the payloads uh, consists of, um, this is kind of an exploded out view. There's several different modules that are, that are installed here. Um, the power unit here is built by NASA Goddard. Um, that's GSFC, Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, and this is a, a power unit that's been used on other programs. So this has some flight heritage from NASA and it's been a proven uh, platform. Um, you can kind of see that there's a, it's like a, these slices that they could add effectively different slices to provide different amounts of power to different buses that are, that are gonna be used. Um, and then the heart of, of the, the communications is the, the fiber optic modem. Um, this is a DPSK modem, that's differential phase shift keying, is the modulation format. Um, it's a very efficient format um, and useful for, for links such as this. Um, one of the goals with, with this is to take a lot of this, uh, this manufacturing capability out to industry. So for, for LLCD, for example, Lincoln built uh, everything of the payload. Um, and now the goal is to go out to industry to, to have more, more capability. So uh, the modem was, was uh, put out for competitive bid and uh, company CACI LGS Innovations um, based out of Florham Park, New Jersey won the bid um, and built this modem on contract. Um, and then the controller electronics box, this is basically the, the heart of the, uh, the unit in terms of um, uh, controlling the the optical modular telescope where to point, and it's the thing that does all the calculations of of where where the ISS is, where LCRD is, um, how to point, how to switch uh, your different data rates. That's what happens in the controller electronics. Uh, so that was again put out for competitive bid, and Seeker won that bid and and built the built the electronics, and then Lincoln Lab is responsible for building the the firmware and software that that runs on that. And then the optical module itself, um, I'll get into a lot more detail here. Uh, this is built by several different companies. Um, parts of it are built by L3 Harris um, and ATA, and then Lincoln Lab does the, the integration of this. So I'd like to dive into some details on the, on the optical module. Um, one of the really important things that we had uh, going forward and looking at, at, at LaserCom in the future is that, uh, you know, there, there have been concerns about the the pointing capability, the tracking capability, and that knowing that that's one of the most important things and, and also one of the most difficult things to build. Uh, we wanted to come up with a, a very flexible platform and uh, that, that was capable of of being modular um, to meet a lot of mission requirements in the future. So this platform called MASCOT, again with the acronyms, this stands for Modular, Agile, Scalable, Optical Terminal. This design was built um, where effectively there's a, a small bench of, op, of, of small beam space optics that exist in the back end optical assembly inside here. And there's a coup de path to that, meaning that um, this can, can remain constant and then your telescope will move along and, and have the same path to get in there. So this architecture allows for variable sizes of telescopes depending on the missions. So if you're going into deep space, you want a, a larger aperture to uh, send more, send a larger beam uh, to get less diffraction and, and have a, a, a smaller beam in, in the far field. Um, or, or for various lengths, um, you wanna be able to tailor the, that size to that. Um, so this is what uh, the, the optical module, the mascot looks like for the Illumina-T program. This is a 10 centimeter aperture, so about four, four inches. This is the same size as the uh, LLCD telescope. Um, it has a star tracker, which is commercially produced, which gives attitude knowledge for the platform. And then there's lots of um, fine steering elements inside the, uh, 
the back end optics that allow for the, the fine steering. So this is on a gimbal that rotates to get your gross pointing. So you, you point this way and then inside there's fine steering mirrors um, for getting really fine tuning that in. And then for also doing the tracking. So once a, a beam has been discovered, then that can, that fine steering mirror can, a fast steering mirror can be used to um, keep the beam centered and tracking. Um, there's also an isolation system here so that uh, this is not impacted or minimize the impact of the launch loads. And then this also has um, a thermal control system such that the, the optical elements don't get too cold. And those are all controlled by the, uh, the controller electronics. So uh, the Illumitis terminal right now is, um, it's making really good progress. Um, we are, we currently have this at Lincoln Laboratory. Um, all the subsystems that, that I described earlier have been assembled and tested together and the entire payload assembly is complete. Um, you can get one view of this here. Um, this is actually in our thermal vacuum chamber, uh, which just completed testing. So as of last week, we have completed the, uh, the platform environmental testing. And the next step is to ship this assembly to NASA Goddard, um, which is taking place early next month. And then we'll go through some final integration and, and assembly steps um, onto the platform. And then the plan right now is that this is actually gonna launch to the, the International Space Station in just in January. So this is coming up very quickly. And then the uh, plan is for that to start operations soon after. So that's the um, kind of where we are with LaserCom in, 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 in the plan and where things are going in, in low earth orbit. And a lot of this is developing this technology to set the stage for future exploration missions. So another mission we're part of now is O2O. And I'll talk about that here. So this is um, NASA's general plan for uh, the Artemis mission. So Artemis as a, as a general uh, flow is planning to get uh, crewed missions to the moon and then beyond to Mars. And what they're calling phase one is the plan to get uh, humans back to the moon and establish a, a, a basically keep, keep us at the moon so that we're having infrastructure there that would then support further exploration of Mars and, and future deep space missions. So ongoing right now is Artemis One. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the the Artemis One platform. So Artemis One is the mission. Um, this flies on the Space Launch System or SLS rocket. And uh, Artemis One uh, is currently uh, going through some final mission tests. Um, the goal is for Artemis One to fly in early um, summer of this year. I know they've they've been doing some wet dress rehearsals that they've discovered some issues. There may be a, a chance of that slipping, but the hope is Artemis One still flies this year. And the goal for this is they're sending the, um, the Orion spacecraft, which is pictured here, um, which is the, the spacecraft that humans will take back to the moon and, and beyond. Um, this is going to fly back to the moon and do a quick orbit and come back. Um, so this is testing out all of the, the systems that are used for, for sending crews back. But then it's not until Artemis II, which is the follow-on mission where humans are actually gonna go, gonna go aboard. Um, and this is a very similar mission to Artemis I in that it's gonna be a lunar flyby. Um, and I'll show you in the next slide what, um, what this, this trajectory is actually gonna look like. Um, but then after we, we demonstrate the capability to send man to the moon and, and, and come back, uh, the next step then is to build up for Artemis III where uh, the plan is to actually land crew on the moon and then start establishing more of a presence there. So the, the current plan is that they're, they're gonna be building a, a system called Gateway, which will be a, a space station that'll exist in the lunar vicinity. Um, this will have uh, supplies can be, can be placed here. Um, there can be uh, basically for refueling operations, um, uh, for, for things that humans need, getting stores of water and food that can be held here then to distribute to various experiments and, and, and scientific and, and human activity that then are happening on the, on the lunar surface. And this then too could be used as like a future refueling spot for, for going out further to, to Mars. Um, so this is currently kind of the concept of what, what Artemis looks like. Um, I know there, there are a lot of activities that's, that's kind of developed. So this may change in the, in the future, but um, as of right now, this is what this looks like. 
Um, so where we fit in is on the Artemis II mission. So after Artemis I flies and, and demonstrates that the, the Orion spacecraft is capable of going to the moon and coming back, then Artemis II is gonna send a crewed mission to the moon and we have a laser comm payload on that um, and it's called the O2O mission. And O2O then stands for Orion Artemis II Optical Comm. Um, the Artemis RF comm capabilities, uh, it's gonna be using a S-band uh, phased array transmitter. And that limits us to about a two megabit per second uh, data rate uh, from the lunar ranges. So a little bit better than the one megabit per second on the Apollo missions, but still not nothing to write home about. And uh, it's not, um, not able to fulfill a lot of the objectives that I outlined earlier for really, really having, um, having a real human presence at the moon and beyond. We want much higher data rates. So O2O LaserCom is gonna operate on the, the Artemis II Orion service module. So uh, this is the Orion module here, up front here, kind of the, the cone shape on top, that's the, the crew module. And then the back here is the service module. And then here you can see our solar panels. Um, there are four of those that, that go out. Um, and so then the, the, uh, the optical terminal is gonna be placed here so that it's kind of pointing between two of those solar panels. And for this mission, the, the O2O modem is gonna have a one watt transmitter. Uh, the, the optical module, which is a mascot design, will have a 10 centimeter aperture, about four inches. And this will now enable us to do uh, 260 megabits per second on the downlink and 80 megabits per second on the, on the uplink. Or I'm sorry, 80 megabits per second is the nominal downlink and then a 20 megabit per second uh, uplink. Um, and so these data rates, you'll, you, you may say, well, hey, you guys did 622 megabits per second on the on, uh, on LLCD. Why is this a, a smaller um, number? Um, the reason for that is um, one of the main goals here was to proliferate this technology throughout industry. So we thought by reducing some of the specifications that could help. Um, but the real goal is to get uh, mission real-time data down and uh, be able to do real-time videos. And this data rate is, is capable of achieving all those, those objectives. Um, and we thought that would also be kind of by reducing specs a little bit that could help by, by getting this technology further out into industry and helping, um, helping the te technology move forward. All right, so what I have here, uh-oh, let's see if this plays. You love when everything worked just fine trying to play a movie through uh through powerpoint and then it gets, comes time to actually show it and it doesn't work all right let me switch over to this view really quick sorry about this um so what we have here is the the plan trajectory of artemis 2 um what the what the orion spacecraft is going to look like um what what it's how it's going to work and then also how the the laser com um portions of the mission are going to fare so as I mentioned before, the, the Orion spacecraft has um, these solar panels and the idea that's gonna provide uh, energy or, or electricity to the, the unit. So the, the spacecraft is gonna be positioned such that the sun is down here and those panels are always gonna be facing the sun. And then the earth is here. You can see where geosynchronous orbit is here. And then this is gonna show the trajectory of the spacecraft um, as it goes out to the moon and then when laser comm operations can take place. So let's see if this will play here. All right, there you go. So there's this orange, or this is purple dot there. Um, the first couple of days, the spacecraft comes out and does this heliocentric orbit, or in higher, sorry, high Earth orbit. And there are a couple of times when it has visibility and ability to have laser comm links back down to the Earth. And then it's gonna go on this long journey out to the moon so we're hitting day three, there's some time for laser comm activities. And then again on day four, one thing you'll notice here is the moon's not there yet. Um, we're actually, the, the spacecraft is actually gonna go out into space before the moon is there. And then just about now on day five, when another laser comm operation takes place, we're gonna see the moon come in here, there it is. So the spacecraft is gonna come out here in the lunar vicinity and then as it crosses the moon's path, the moon there uh, provides enough of a gravity boost to 
have the have the pay, uh, the spacecraft slingshot back uh, back towards Earth, and then it's going to come back here and have some more laser com links um, on its way back to Earth. So that's what the the mission trajectory um, looks like, and as you can tell, there's going to be certain launch windows in which case these uh, this is going to be valid for. So as we get closer to launch, um, we'll we'll be determining what the specific dates are. So um, this chart's a little busy, but bear with me here. Um, it's, it tells a really interesting story of why LaserCom is, is so interesting for this mission. So if you follow me here with my pointer up through first this, this uh, purple line on the graph and then over here into the blue line, what this is showing is the amount of data that is being generated by the Orion uh, 2 mission as it's going through its, its nine or 10 days in space. So there's a tremendous amount of data that's that's created on the first day as the the spacecraft is launching. Um, all sorts of sensors are are telling um, are, are being recording about how that launch is going, how the humans are doing, how everything is going, and then um, you generate about 250 gigabits worth of data in that first day, and then over the rest of the days, there's about 50 gigs of data that that are generated. So you have about 300 gigabytes of data by the the end of the mission. If the S-band signal, the RF signal, was being used continuously, and uh, that has a one megabit per one megabyte per second um, data rate, uh, that's you can see how how that data is transmitted. You can effectively think you've got this giant buffer of 250 mega uh, 250 gigabytes here that you're then trying to download. If you're using the S-band continuously it can't keep up with the data that's generated. And by the end of the mission, it's anticipated that there's still about 230 uh, gigabytes uh, of data that have not been transmitted. So, um, you know, if you're okay waiting for your spacecraft to get down back to earth, that, that can be okay. But what we really want is real time feedback of what's going on and, and being able to, um, Inter, you know, like we, we saw in the LLCD program, there was a, a software issue that was was noticed. And by downloading that data and having folks at Earth analyze it, a, a fix could be employed really quickly. So there's a real need for having uh, an ability to look at this data in real time and be able to interject if necessary. So with the plan kind of nominal configuration of, of, uh, of the LaserCom system with one hour a day of 80 megabit per second downlink operation. This gives you uh, 36 gigabytes of data downloaded, um, which is an increase of 6x of what, what was done with the S-band and does let you download basically the entire buffer worth of data um, over the mission duration. But then if we're upping this to the maximum 260 megabytes per second um, optical link, we can now download 117 gigs per day and all the data would download in four days, then you're basically keeping up with, with the rest of it. Then if you increase this to uh, two hours a day of, of transmission, after basically the, the second day, you're, you've, you've gotten all of your data downlinked and then you're, you're keeping up for the rest of the mission. So having this, this high data rate capability really gives you um, much better insight and control into your, your human missions. So at a very high level, um, this is what the mission architecture looks like. We have the Orion spacecraft element here, and then on that is the space terminal element. I'll, I'll get into these details in a second, but it effectively has the same uh, subsystems that we showed on the Illuma T payload. There's a, a power unit, a modem, a controller electronics, and the, the optical module, uh, the mascot uh, telescope system. So there's an RF back channel here to Mission Control. So Mission Control is operated out of NASA Johnson Space Center. Um, Mission Control Center is MCC. This is like if you've, um, any uh, anytime you're watching like a movie with, with NASA and they've got the big control center with all the, everybody at the console, that's what, that's what this is. Um, we additionally have a, a, a console dedicated to the, the optical communications operation. This is called LaserCom Space Terminal Console, another acronym here, LSTOC. Um, this is how we primarily control the, the optical terminal and monitor progress. And then we have the um, LaserCom Planning and Analysis Center, LPAC, um, which is a way of, of doing the analysis um, 
of the lasercom link and, and interjecting if any any changes are needed. Um, and part part of the goal here too is coming up with very standardized ways of of operating this. This is very similar to the the operation center that was uh, deployed on on LLCD. This is now just doing it with uh, at a bigger um, at a bigger um, scale. So instead of having our operation center um, at a in an office at, at Lincoln here at at uh, in in Lexington. Um, We'll have it now at Michigan Control Center, so it's with the with the main um, action. Um, I mentioned before there's a couple different ground terminals. Um, uh, TMF is Table Mountain. This is in California. This is a ground terminal run by folks at JPL, um, and this is a ground terminal that is also servicing uh, Illuma T or, or I guess LCRD uh, specifically, but then the Illuma T data flows down here through LCRD. Um, so the Table Mountain terminal is um, really being designed as a, a multi-purpose terminal to um, facilitate multiple programs in the future. And then the primary ground terminal um, for, for this mission is at White Sands in New Mexico. And this ground terminal is a, a reuse of, of the same facility that was uh, used for the LLCD demonstration um, in, 2013 and 2014. Um, effectively, we're using the telescopes from, from that mission. Um, and we're um, because the data rate is decreased from 622 down to 260, we actually require less, uh, less collect aperture. Um, so when, when, as before, we had four telescopes with four superconducting detector arrays, now we're only using two of them. So it simplifies the system. Again, with the uh, one of the overarching goals to try to um, proliferate the technology out in the industry further. Um, simplifying the system here um, uh, was, was greatly beneficial. Uh, so then there's a ground data element is, is at White Sands as well. So basically all of the, the data flow that goes to mission control, either from Table Mountain or from the, the optical terminal at, at White Sands is gonna flow through uh, the, um, the ground data element into, into uh, back to mission control. Then there's also kind of the central planning of, of all the laser comm operations takes place here as well. Um, some more, more detail here on the, on the space terminal element. Um, I mentioned before here, this is the, the Orion spacecraft. You can see the, the solar panels here. Um, the payload is gonna take place here. This is the uh, Orion service module. And then the crew module is, is up front. Um, and the, uh, the payload, again, is divided into four subsystems. There's the, the optical module using the mascot technology, the, the modem, the power unit, and then the controller electronics. And the way that this is, uh, is, is done here, instead of having one single platform like on the Illuma T payload, now in this case, the, the optical module is now on the outside of the spacecraft on the, the back of the, uh, the service module. So it's pointing, um, able to point here between the, the two solar panels. And then the controller electronics module as well is outside there. And then the, uh, the modem and the power converter are together on a platform called the, the inner wall assembly that lives on the inner wall of the, of the service module and what they call the crew module adapter. So how the service module attaches to the, the crew module. Um, overall, um, between these, uh, these different islands, there's a, a mass of 76 kilograms, which includes all the mounting hardware and the, the thermal controls and the isolation structures. And uh, this draws a 165 watts of wall plug efficiency. I'm sorry, 165 watts, uh, just wall plug. Um, I wanna dive in a little bit more on the controller electronics here. So this is, um, with, with the idea of going out into industry, um, this again is the same uh, hardware as used on Illumina T. So there was one contract that was submitted for both programs um, with the desire to build a platform that could be useful for multiple projects going forward. Um, so it's the same, same hardware that's used on both programs um, and very similar firmware. So we have kind of the same code base with um, some kind of forks for uh, the Illumina T program or the, or the O2O program. Uh, so the hardware here was developed by and built by Seeker. And then again, the kind of the primary purposes of this hardware are to control the pointing mechanisms of the, of the optical module, um, provide the command and telemetry interfaces of the, of the space terminal payload um, to the spacecraft, um, and then does uh, some of the temperature controls. And so in this case, this is mounted on the exterior of the spacecraft and it includes extra radiators and heaters for, um, for that thermal control. 
Then the inner wall assembly here is um, consists of the uh, the modem and the the power control unit. Um, so again, this um, the power control units. This, this is the same one that's used on the Illuma T program um, provided by NASA Goddard. Um, and this modem was also put out for a competitive bid. Um, and, and again, uh, CACI, uh, LGS Innovations won that contract and, and built this modem. This is a very different modem though on, uh, on O2O compared to um, Illuma T. Um, that modem was a DPSK system. This is a, a pulse position modulation system, which um, for the peak power or, or for our uh, Average power limited amplifiers are, are really nice in that you can get um, very high duty cycles where effectively you have one pulse um, where all the energy is and then many, many, uh, many slots of um, where data could be that, that doesn't have the data um, that creates very high peak powers. So if we're going over very long distances like, like this, um, uh, the PPM uh, modulation format is, is very nice. Um, and with, with this, um, using this, this PPM um, modulation format, uh, again, the, the hope is really to get, um, start developing industry standards. Um, and so we've, we've uh, um, partnered with the, the CCSDS standards. This is a, a standards body that, that um, is responsible for a lot of space-based communication standards. Um, so there's now an optical communication standard that that talks about um, how pulse position modulation is used for some of these deep space links. Uh, so the modem here is a one watt transmitter. We had a, we had a half watt on, on LLCD, so a little bit more power here. Um, and this allows for uh, 10 or 20 megabit per second on the uplink. And then the downlink uh, is between 20 and 260 megabits per second. Uh, so this is all uh, effectively, this takes ethernet data in from the spacecraft and then converts it to an optical signal, amplifies that signal, and then delivers that signal over fiber optics to the uh, optical module, which then broadcasts that into free space. Um, and then, so yeah, there's, this, is, this has some isolator uh, as well so that and the launch loads are minimized. And so O2O um, is in, is, is also at a very, um, in a good place here. Um, all the islands have gone through full assembly and testing. Um, the, the whole system has gone through the terminal level thermal vacuum testing at, at Lincoln Laboratory. That was all completed successfully. And we're now going through kind of the final stages of software integration and progress um, and planning to be completing this, uh, the terminal here um, in the springtime. And the plan right now is for this to be installed um, at the Orion spacecraft at, at Kennedy Space Center in Florida in late 2022. Um, but that might depend on, um, uh, effectively I've heard there's a day for day slip between Artemis 1 and, and Artemis 2 launches. So if Artemis 1 launch slips, then Artemis 2 launch um, might slip as well. And um, there, there are a lot of different um, operations of how things need to go onto the spacecraft. So we may be delayed um, in deployment depending on, uh, on how Artemis 1 fares. Um, but then if everything goes as according to schedule, um, the plan is for Artemis 2 to launch in 2024 and for operations to take place over that those 10 days when uh, the crew is going to the moon and back. So that's, uh, that's the programs that we're working on right now. Um, and you can kind of see how these programs then are paving the way for, for future exploration of, of deep space and beyond. Um, I want to touch now on a couple couple uh, future future missions. Um, uh, two missions specifically that are that are going on are, are close to close to launching, and then some kind of more aspirational uh, plans that are that are going on. Uh, so right now, um, Lincoln and NASA are involved in a program called T-Bird. Another acronym for you. This is the terabyte infrared delivery. Um, and what's cool about this, the the idea behind this is how can you build a very small uh, payload um, and deliver very bursty high data rate communications. Uh, so this is a 2U CubeSat design that uses commercial optical transceivers. Um, so this is a 100 gigabit per second unit. Um, and there are actually two of these that are used together to create a 200 gigabit per second link. And uh, data is buffered on here on these high capacity solid state drives. And the idea here is that this is gonna be in low earth orbit, um, going around quickly and when um, it has line of sight to a ground terminal, it's going to download as much data as possible. So um, 200 gigabits per second. Um, 
And the idea is that you can deliver like a terabytes worth of data or more in a day. So that's where that, that name comes from. And this is actually a really exciting stage of development. Um, we have folks who are um, out at, uh, with the with the with the launch vehicle right now um, that this is installed and this is planning to launch just in June so we're really excited for this to to go up and start launch uh, start um, operations uh, this summer and another um, another effort that that's going on is is called Deep Space Optical Communications or DSOC and this is a, a JPL mission um, this is going out to the Psyche asteroid so this is a again kind of like a like Laddie um, where there's a there's a scientific purpose to this mission, um, but then it's it's also a, a great uh, opportunity to demonstrate the benefits of laser communications and how we can download a lot of a lot of data using this this uh, technology. Uh, so this is a mission going to the Psyche asteroid, which is located between Mars and Jupiter, and uh, this has a four watt transmitter um, with a 22 centimeter aperture. So you can see again, this is higher power and, and a larger aperture than the uh, the missions we're talking about. Um, but this is, um, and it's it's going to be operating depending on the range and how far out it is. It's going to start and have hundreds of megabits per second of capabilities down to under a megabit per second once it's out at the kind of the final um, final location. But still, this this represents a, a much larger increase in, in data rate capabilities over traditional RF systems. So um, we're really excited about um, how this technology is going to um, help kind of pave the way for some of the future. Uh, deep space exploration missions. And again, this one also is really um, on track. I'm sorry, I have a typo here. This should be on, on T-Bird. That should be June 2022, not 21. Not yet, uh, 22. But then this one soon after in August of 22. So that's coming up soon. And um, we'll start uh, LaserCom operations as it uh, travels out and then um, has about a one-year planned mission lifetime. Um, and then so with uh, kind of the thought of gateway and and other uh, you kind of using the moon as a, as a base for future as kind of a staging ground for future deep space explorations. Um, one of the one of the discussions that have been happening um, is how to kind of create a, a laser come network that could provide really nice um, data trunking capability between the earth and and the moon and various assets that are going to be deployed around there. So one of the uh, kind of the the the. Uh, the architectures that's being proposed is having a high rate trunking capability that you would have a uh, either gateway or, or some type of um, satellite that would be in the lunar vicinity that would have high rate capability of going between the earth and and the moon um, and one of the one of the proposed architectures for that would be a, a 10 watt modem and a 10 centimeter optical module so similar um, optical module um, sizes now this would again the idea be using the mascot technology that's been been designed um, but then with a higher power here you could have a, a much higher data rate capability so five gigabit per second and and 200 megabit um, forward link and some of the talks are using a, a coherent modem for this on the ground and and for this this trunk link and then from there, um, the thought is you can be distributing between low Earth, low Earth um, orbiting satellites or um, other assets uh, like ground rovers or uh, or different um, different uh, uh, orbiting vehicles that are that are over or around the moon um, and being able to have basically a full network. And so that's that's kind of exciting where, where things are looking ahead. Um, so kind of in summary, we're it's a really exciting time for laser communications. Um, it's kind of a, a, it's been proven at this point um, that it can really revolutionize a lot of human space exploration missions because the bandwidth is just so much higher than traditional RF uh, comm systems. Um, then we have two missions now that are that are coming up, the LCRD mission with, with the Illumity payload on, uh, on low earth orbit, um, demonstrating how high rate communications can can really help uh, things in low Earth orbit on the ISS, and then O2O kind of laying the groundwork for uh, both the moon exploration and some of the other deep space human exploration activities that NASA's planned. Um, and then there's these other missions that are coming up as well. So we're just excited that um, a lot of laser comm technology appears to be just really helping um, crude space exploration in the future. So that's what I have. Um, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Bob. That was great. I loved all the acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, 
if uh, if anyone has questions, you can either enter them into the chat or you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, David did, uh, David Lees did put in a couple questions. David, do you wanna go ahead and ask your questions that you had? Uh, sure, um, you didn't say anything, uh, maybe I missed it about uh, wavelengths. And I was wondering whether you had, you know, chosen a single type of laser and wavelength and if not sort of what system can, considerations drive your your uh, your choices yeah no thanks so, um i should have mentioned something about that yeah everything um everything that discussed here is in the the uh this the optical communication c band or kind of the 1550 nanometer type of range um different wavelengths are used on the different programs for, for kind of different purposes um like we'll have a, a have a communications uh wavelength um so like for O2O, for example, we have, a, I think, a 1545 nanometer wavelength through the uplink transmitter, um, 1553 nanometer wavelength on the, on the downlink transmitter. And then there's also a, a beacon uh, wavelength and how the, uh, the, the, the space terminal uses to acquire and track the, the, the uplink signal off of. Um, so everything's in the, in the C band there. Um, and typically what, what, what's been used, um, so the, the general architecture we, we use for these systems is a, a master oscillator power amplifier configuration. So the master oscillator consists of a fiber optic laser. Um, traditionally, it's been a distributed feedback laser, a, a DFB for another acronym there. Um, and then that usually goes through a, a MOX under modulator to Im impart the data signal. And then that goes through an erbium doped fiber amplifier to get the amplification. Do we have any other questions for Bob? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to ask one. Um, what's what's the path to commercialization of a lot of this technology? Um, you talked about how sort of this, this desire to um, to make these uh, terminals buildable by industry, but um, hopefully Artemis one and two are just the first of many future space missions. Can you talk about the path to getting this this out to mass production? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so right now, um, this was kind of a first round of bids for for various companies, um, and we we've seen a lot of competitive uh, competitive interest for building um, various parts of the of the system. Um, so like for modem vendors, for example, there've been there've been interest from a, a number of different companies. Um, so I guess we I guess we've already kind of I guess seen that there's uh, there's interest there, um, and then the hope is with with future missions then. Uh, that those also go out to industry and that now a number of companies are have some of that capability and that they are then able to bid on these programs and uh and move forward so i know there are a number of other um there are a number of other laser com efforts that are are being being developed that i'm not talking about here um but that those don't go through like a bid process and and industry partners or people in industry are, are bidding on those and and creating those those components did, did that answer your question Directly, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Interesting to see that that there is a lot of uh, industry. Uh, yeah. Um, I I have sort of follow-ons. What's the main limitation for these? Is it the power consumption of all the optical components or the weight? Uh, like, if you had to pick one thing that was hard to to beat down. Uh, you mean like limitation in terms of um, like does the design challenge may be another mm, better way to put it. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so design challenges, um, I mean, one thing I guess we've seen is with, uh, with some of the industry partners, um, on, on like the modem side of things, there's a, not a lot of places have the experience with both developing, like fiber optic modems, um, both like amplifiers, um, building the the modulation form or the modulation capability, or the really kind of the, the the processing capability, and then also being able to package it for space. So, you know, a lot of a lot of places are really good at one of those things. You know, there's a very vibrant uh, uh, fiber optic networking, you know, um, industry. There's, there's a whole big commercial industry there that. Um, but that's designed for terrestrial applications. So it's then kind of getting that skill into a package that works for space. So it's kind of the, 
I, I guess I would say it's like kind of the system integration then. It's how do you get all of these different um, specialties working together in a way that um, gives you a viable product for, for delivering in space? Gotcha, thanks. Got a short question uh, on materials, Robert. A great, great talk. Are the 10 centimeter telescopes that you've talked about generally uh, 6061 T6 aluminum? Are they silicon carbide? Are they ULE and INVAR? Is, what's the, uh, the flavor of choice at the moment? Hmm. You know, I'm, I'm afraid I can't answer that question. Um, I'm trying to see if another, um, I don't know, Farzana, do you know? I'm a, I come from the, the modem side of things, so I'm less, uh, less plugged into good details like that. Um, I know like some beryllium had been used previously. Um, do you, does, does anyone here know what happened, like what we're using for, the, uh, for these particular units? Yeah, it was, um, it was definitely some, some interesting material choice. I, I can't remember the, the name of it uh, either, so sorry. That's okay. Is there any good uh, published reference material that one can look at for the optics themselves for the hardware? I, I think so. I think we've had some. Um, I think we've had some publications um, from the groups out on the mascot design. Um, I can, uh, I'll dig up a, a couple papers and send a David Lees to forward on to you. Would that work? Or, or if you drop your email address in the chat, I can, I can get you the link. I can get you no, that, that's from David. That would be great. And okay. thanks, David. Sorry, David, to put you on the spot there. Email CT. I have a question about uh, assimilation. And perhaps if you could describe like what types of of hurdles or issues that could cause um, in this technology or in these systems and what you guys might do to try to mitigate those? Yeah, so there's um, a couple ways to go about that. Um, the main one is that an interleaver is used on the, on the, uh, on the, on the data processing path. So you're able to, um, there's both coding and interleaving. So interleaving can help you kind of survive through those deep fades where you, know, you might lose a chunk of data. You're, um, you, you can kind of distribute it. And then with coding, there's a bit of redundancy in the data. So um, a lot of that work's been done through kind of modeling um, what, what simulations to expect based on um, uh, various kind of previous experiments and, and previous measurements and, and then building fade profiles and then kind of designing the interleavers around, uh, you know, adjusting the parameters based on what, um, what profiles you're expecting to see. Okay, so more more software based solutions than hardware based mitigation. Right. Okay, thank you. Hey, Bob, uh, this is Ezra. I just wanted to say really amazing presentation. It was really, uh, uh, really fantastic. Oh, um, and I was gonna say, I really like the, the video that you had of the um, the O2O mission as it was going, flying out and showing the, the link period. That was really, uh, really sweet. Um, one question that I have for you, is there any reason that the O2O uh, terminal could not link up with the LCRD GeoSat um, to increase the, the mission link, the mission, excuse me, link duration times? Yeah, um, I guess the main main issue here is just modulation formats. They're, they're built with, with incompatible modulation formats. The uh, um, the LCRD uh, GeoLink is has a, a DPSK um, format, um, and and uh, I know at one point there was talk of of also putting in a, a PPM format, um, but I, I think even then the the flavors of PPM weren't uh, weren't compatible. Okay, but, but no, I mean in principle, you know that kind of like in that last uh, kind of that last uh, uh, kind of like future architecture design. That's you know that's exactly kind of part of the forward thinking types of things. Once these are Kind of deployed in the future that's exactly what you'd have is you'd have something in in geo that that could give you give you capability like that mm -hmm. i've got uh two more questions if i may yeah sure so uh the second uh question here is that for the illuma t terminal when, once it links up with the LC, uh, excuse me lcrd satellite is is there any form of ephemeris data that's heading to the the controller 
on the terminal mm -hmm. or is there, you know, is it strictly just going into maybe like an open loop uh, search mode? Nope, absolutely. Yeah, no, ephemeris data is there, um, both on the where, uh, yeah, and that, that's, uh, you know, part of what's different in the flight software is, is how do you handle um, spacecraft going to the moon versus on, on uh, in low Earth orbit. Um, and where, where things, you know, in low Earth orbit, you're going very quickly around, around the Earth. Um, but yeah, no, that's actively being, uh, and it's actually really interesting, the, the way that um, gets calculated, there's effectively a uh, an ephemeris file that's that's kind of like you know there's tracking stations that know where um, the the ISS is that kind of give that information. The ISS has some onboard sensors that also feed that information, and then the um, the uh, the optical module Star Tracker also is looking at at stars and kind of figuring out where its position is in in, in the world. Um, and so then it's the job of the controller electronics to kind of get all those inputs, kind of weigh them appropriately, figure out what what should be the most important factor, and then also then know where, what it's supposed to talk to. So in this case, LCRD, where, where that is, um, and and then kind of figure out, okay, I think I'm here. I think where I need to go is there, and now I need to point that way. So yeah, that's yeah. all done in real time. Okay, so you've got a, you've got a confluence of the, the position data as well as your... Um your um, um, your call it your your TLE information that's all getting uh, fed and spliced together. Um, awesome. Yep. Last question for you: uh, Are you able to share qualitatively at all how the uh, LCRD uh, links are doing so far? Yeah. So um, from what I've heard, we've we've been working with some folks who are um, on Illumina T who are also working in LCRD. So as we're Kind of fi finalizing the LCR, or uh, sorry, finalizing the Illumina T um, testing here before shipping to Goddard. Some of them are involved in those ongoing activities. Um, from what I've heard, things are going really well. They've, I think, performed um, a ground-to-ground -ground links. So they've they've gone from uh, Hawaii to LCRD to uh, to California. Um, so they've linked the terminals together. And I, I, what I've heard is that those experiments are going well. Uh, kind of the onboarding process of um, of operations has been going well, and it seems like it's been really successful. And they're they're on track and and excited for Illumina to get up there so that uh, they can they can complete that full link. Cool, awesome. That's uh, super exciting. Hey Bob, I have a question from someone in the chat. Um, they were wondering if uh, weather is a concern during the brief communication windows on the Artemis program. Yep, it's it's a possibility. Um, and so there are multiple ground terminals. Um, one one thing of note: the the ground terminal locations were chosen because of um, of weather, part, partly because of weather reasons. So White Sands, New Mexico, doesn't have a lot of cloud coverage, um, relatively speaking to other other parts of the country. So um, th that's one reason for that. Um, but there there is then a a kind of like there's a pre-pass meeting that'll take place where you'll look at the weather forecast and say, oh, it's clear in California, it's cloudy in New Mexico, let's use that, that terminal first. Gotcha. Great, thanks. Do we have uh, maybe one more question for Bob? No? Okay. Well, Bob, thanks so much for joining us. We really, really appreciate it. It was a very interesting talk. Yeah, yeah. thanks to everybody for coming. Appreciate it and appreciate all the questions too. Thank yeah, you, we um, we uh, really appreciate that you spent your evening with us. So um, thank you.